Now I'd like to introduce today's speakers. Lily Calderwood is Extension Wild Blueberry Specialist and Assistant Professor of Horticulture at the University of Maine. Sean Burkle is the State Climatologist and a Research Assistant Professor in the Climate Change Institute. And Glenn Kaler is Associate Scientist with Cooperative Extension. And their pr presentation, as you'll see, focuses on an innovative collaboration with Maine farmers. Lily, Sean, and Glenn bring a lot of expertise and experience to this work. And one reason we were so interested in having them discuss their project is because the Mitchell Center provided a seed grant, no pun intended, to help them advance this work. In fact, our seed grant program is part of the Mitchell Center's commitment to help grow UMaine's capacity for stakeholder engaged, solutions driven, interdisciplinary research. In the last 14 years, we provided funding for more than 50 pilot projects, most of which have gone on to receive significant external funding. So let's find out more about their project. Take it away, Lily. Okay. Here we are. Sorry about that. Okay. So my name is Lily Calder, as David mentioned, and we're so appreciative to be here to um, talk about this project with you today. And um, we have had a great um, experience doing this project uh, with, a, with this group of people. Um, I just wanted to mention Aaron Roche is another person who helped with this project, who was a previous crop insurance educator. And there were two other folks who really um, helped to bring this together and continue to be helpful. One is Shauna Annis in the School of Biology and Ecology. She's an associate professor of mycology and uh, Brogan Tooley, who's my research assistant. So without any further ado, uh, today the title of our talk is The Future of Farming, Building Tools for Tech Savvy Farmers, and some who are not tech savvy. <laughs> and this project really came together through a group called MECAN, which you may have heard of. Um, MECAN stands for the Maine Climate and Agriculture Network. And this is a group of faculty and postdocs at UMaine who come together once a month and we talk about uh, issues impacting Maine farmers related to weather and climate. Um, and I think it, we've been doing this for about five years now and some of the collaborations that have come out of it have been fantastic, including this project. So our mission is to increase communication between um, increased communication and identify challenges, opportunities, and potential solutions regarding climate and Maine agriculture. Our project objectives were to first better understand how and when farmers use weather data in pest and crop management. Secondly, to identify farmer top priorities for the following. First is improvements to weather information, preferred ways to receive weather information, and major pests and timing of pest management on farms. We decided to hone in on three groups of growers in Maine. So we focused on mixed vegetable growers, wild blueberry growers, and apple growers. We are missing input from dairy farms, uh, livestock producers, potato industry. So there are definitely um, groups who were not included in this uh, work, uh, but hopefully they will be in the future. And our third objective was to identify next steps to bring more weather tools to growers. And our project timeline, our, this project began back in summer of 2019 when we surveyed uh, farmers at uh, farm meetings. So we have um, extension meetings that are outside on farms. We brought uh, the survey to them and that gave us a bulk of, of people, of respondents, which was 91 respondents. Then we continued to uh, distribute the same survey at the Ag Trade Show, which is an event that happens in the winter <clears throat> in Augusta, uh, where really a lot of growers gather. Uh, so we gained another 65 respondents there. And from
from those surveys, um, we were able to uh, get several people from these three different groups to participate in focus group discussions that happen uh, further along in the winter. So we have these three groups. Again, uh, the Wild Blueberry group had five people, uh, Apple group had seven people, and mixed vegetable had six. Overall, we had input from 156 Maine farmers, which is great. They range from uh, York County all the way up to Penobscot <clears throat> uh, and uh, Washington County. Our project methods were to really leverage our existing farmer extension relationships. So in extension, we, we are uh, very, uh, our work really focused focuses on our relationships with farmers and uh, their respect for our work and then our respect for their expertise and so that we can bring uh, their thoughts to you and we can bring all the research done at the University of Maine out into the field to them. Uh, so extension is really this bridge that um, is bridge of information. Uh, so our Methods were really to have a survey, which was a paper and online survey, and this was distributed uh, in these in-person meetings, as I mentioned, and also online through our extension stakeholder newsletters. We had the focus group recruitment through the survey, so there was a question on there, would you like to be um, a bigger part of this project? Are you interested in attending focus groups over the winter? Um, and those focus groups were uh, approximately five hour meetings uh, with each commodity group where we spent a lot of time uh, delving into the, the pests that are a problem on their farms for their specific crop and the weather information that they actually use and what weather information would they like to use um, moving forward. And then we had a final meeting where <clears throat> we sought their additional feedback if they had thought of anything else, uh, but also to show them that we had changed a few things on existing weather tool um, mo mobile platforms and um, online platforms. So through our initial meetings with each commodity group, we went and we tweaked things on existing uh, decision support tool websites that Glenn will talk a little bit more about. So participants were compensated $350 plus uh, lunch um, at the meetings. And I really want to just thank the farmers who participated in this project. We are nothing without them and you know they are really the experts. They are tech savvy. They are um, ready for the next century of challenges. Farming is inherently um, challenging, especially regarding the weather. They are uh, truly at mercy of the weather, to the weather. And um, so we really appreciate their, their time and we appreciate our relationship with them. So now I'll share a few of our results from all of this survey and focus group data. Uh, the first is where do farmers check the weather? So the farmer wakes up and they literally start the day by checking the weather. What can I accomplish today? And what can I not accomplish today because of the weather? <laughs> so we did find that the majority or you know, yeah, the majority of people are looking at NOAA or the National Weather Service. They might not know that <clears throat> NOAA and the National Weather Service are the same entity, but they are looking there, which is great. Um, a lot of people are still watching TV to see uh, the weather forecast. Um, and they're using phone apps, Weather Underground, AccuWeather, but they're also using the tools that we do have available for them. So AgRadar and AgriNet are two online websites that are decision support tool uh, platforms for farmers. The ag radar is for Apple um, models specifically, whereas the agrinet is specific for wild blueberry. 
next question um, to share with you was uh, what pest and crop decision support tools are farmers currently using? So the majority are not using any, <clears throat> any of these pest and crop decision support tools. But those who are, are using the ones that UMaine provides them. Um, and a good portion of people are searching in other places for this type of information, uh, which include growing degree day models from other sites, um, their personal weather stations, they may be doing a calculation on their own, um, newsletters, communications with extension specialists who might be using one of these <coughs> platforms. And so we did specifically ask them, do you use weather-based crop or pest management tools? And as the previous slide showed, the majority are not. Um, and, but under 30, uh, just under 30 people are using them. And then uh, are you interested in using these tools? So yes, the majority of people are interested in using these tools. What are the most important farm management decisions? Um, the assumption is that these are farm management decisions that would be easier if you had a crop and pest, crop or pest management decision tool. <laughs> uh, so 40% said that spraying, uh, spraying would be easier and more accurate with uh, one of these tools or multiple tools. Um, and this is expected. We would, we would say that um, spraying for insecticide, fungicide, herbicide, these are all pest management um, sprays that are much more effective if you use one of these tools that can predict when exactly a pest is going to emerge or when exactly a pathogen is going to be um, infectious. We were interested to see that 17% said that planting date and 14% said that harvest date um, could be improved or become more precise, more efficient with one of these tools. Um, and irrigation, so when to irrigate is another one that would be a lot easier if they had a um, decision support tool for that. Other uh, things on the farm that farmers would use these tools for include um, when to expect an infection, when to thin or prune, when they can enter the field, so when is the soil uh, workable, when is there workable soil, um, and cost. A lot of people wanted to hear um, how, if, if a weather or decision support tool could help them predict how this crop um, or how the, how the current weather would impact their crop yield and therefore economics of the farm. And so what factors impact growing grower decision making the most? And so these are weather factors, frost, rain, wind are the top ones. Um, frost is, uh, Forty-one percent, and in small fruit and apples, peaches, tree fruit, and small fruit, we do have a lot of late frost events occurring. Uh, so that's really part of where this um, comes in. Uh, but also, mixed vegetable growers would have frost events where they would need to go out and cover their vegetables, for example. And rain is pretty straightforward. I, I would think that rain includes both drought and uh, flooding. That would really impact the farm management. And then wind. It was very interesting that a lot of growers um, don't have access to wind speed or they would like more accurate access to wind speed data, um, which ties into the previous question that a lot of these folks would like to use weather tools to predict when to spray, because wind speed um, can, can help you apply um, one of these products more safely. So now I'll turn it over to Glenn, who's gonna talk about uh, kind of the past um, 
the current and past ag radar um, program that has been happening at UN. So I would just point out that MECAN, the Maine Climate and Ag Network, is also open to students um, and anybody, actually. We have farmers and um, state agency people, but especially, I see there are a lot of students on the webinar here, and they're certainly encouraged to show up at um, MECAN meetings. So Lily talked about the weather, and the weather is obviously important. That's why we all got into this work, because it drives farming and drives our work with farmers. Um, well, I'm going to sort of, Lily went back in time, I'm going to sort of shoot ahead in concept and talk about the decision support stuff, and then we'll get back, work, work, my, work my way back to the weather part. So I, I work with apple growers, other tree fruit growers, and what I found is I was constantly on the phone talking about the weather because that drove our decision making. And that's how Ag Radar got started. Um, Ag Radar developed out of taking weather data and using it to drive a lot of degree day models and, and uh, disease infection period models, which we needed to make decisions in orchards. So there's, there's a long list there and there's more than what I'm showing here. These are, these are just the major pests, um, the major diseases and major insects. I haven't done much with weeds, um, but there are opportunities to also run weather-based models to help with weed management. So what we do with these is what we want to know is when does this particular disease or insect pest become a problem? So when do we need to start dealing with it? Um, how severe is it going to be? That's especially for the diseases because in different weather conditions, the severity varies. And then once you do put on a spray, how long is it good for? If it rains a lot right after, your spray wears off. And besides the uh, actual interventions and the, the spraying decisions, it's also when to monitor because you can't do everything. So we want to identify the key dates when you need to be out looking for this or that specific thing. Also the spray conditions, you can't spray when it's gonna be too windy. Um, you don't wanna spray when there's a freeze coming up. Uh, there's a whole lot of things that weather impacts in many different dimensions. Irrigation is becoming more important as Lily alluded to, and we can use the, the precipitation forecast and observations to look at the irrigation needs and help schedule that. Protecting honeybees and other pollinators is important. And so one of the models looks at when the honeybees are going to be active and that helps us avoid them because the, all days are not created equal in terms of honeybee activity. And finally, and more into the horticulture end, we wanna know when things are gonna be ready for harvest. And if you can know that ahead of time, that's great for scheduling work and, and you know, getting your resources lined up. So these are just a few examples of the kinds of things we're doing. Um, this is fire blight. It's a bacterial disease. It operates very quickly. In 20 minutes, the population of the bacteria can double. That's how fast this, this disease can operate. So growers need as much lead time as possible to know how conditions are shaping up of whether they need to treat this disease. And unfortunately, the treatment really needs to go on just before the infection hits. So you can't just put it on Monday in case there's gonna be an infection on Friday because by Friday, the treatment wouldn't be any good. So the height of these bars tells the growers how serious the conditions are. And the dotted bars are sort of the potential risk and the red bars are when all conditions have been met for that disease to initiate an attack. So the days with the high red bars are the ones they really wanna look out for. The different horizontal lines show the different sensitivities of different orchards because not all orchards have the same history with this disease. So the same threshold does not apply. So if the orchard has a very recent history, they would be at the red line and they're very sensitive to this disease. Whereas the blue line is an orchard that's never had the disease. This has never even been close to the orchard. And so they can afford a much higher threshold. There's another example for an insect pest is the apple maggot fly. And so we do this for a number of different pests. And in this case, 
um, if you sprayed on July 27th, you would look up your spray date on that table and you go across and unfortunately you can't see my, can you see my, yeah, I got my mouse. Um, I hope you can see it. If you sprayed on the 27th, what the, the model tells you that these different treatments have different sensitivities to rain. So if you used Imidan, um, because of the rain that happened, um, if you sprayed on the 27th, there was a rain later on here that made it wear off on August 4th. So that tells you when that treatment is no longer effective. And if it's still during the period when the pest is active, you need to spray again. And you get to the next table and you look, you find August 4th, and that tells you when that spray, if you spray on that day, when that one will wear off. And that just helps the growers be more efficient with their spraying. They don't overspray and they, they don't underspray because they know much more exactly when treatments need to be in position. Another example, there's a lot of words on this slide, but just the, the text within the circles are the main things. In the good old days or the bad old days, um, the, the insecticides that were used were pretty broad spectrum. And so, you know, they killed insects. That's what they did. The new materials that they're using now, those materials have largely been retired. The new materials are much more specific and they're much softer chemistry, softer in the terms of environmental impact. But because they're softer, they don't just kill everything. They only, they only affect a few certain things. In fact, within codling moth, these early treatments only affect, they have to be in place before the eggs are laid. And so they have to go on very early. And then another set of materials, they want to be on a little later when the eggs have been laid and the larvae are hatching. And so they don't affect the eggs, whereas the first materials only affect the eggs. And then if you're going after um, both stages, then there's another level down here, which is more the traditional date of when growers would put on a treatment. So it's become more like pharmaceuticals. The dosing and the treatments are very specific and you need to know exactly when to do that. And it's virtually impossible to do that without having weather data because they're driven by weather. So those are some examples from Apple world, you know, what really excites me going ahead is this approach is not just available for apples. It can be used for potatoes and vegetables, and it's already being used for blueberries and even livestock. I just heard on a webinar the other day that the person speaking from Flood Dairy Farm said that one impact of climate change is the number of days when they have to manage for heat stress is much increased. And so we have climate-based um, models. It's called the Cattle Comfort Index because it's not the same as the heat index, index for humans, that cattle are sensitive to heat. Um, and that model takes account of heat and humidity and wind and sun and helps dairy farmers and other livestock managers know when to not move the animals because when you move the animals, they build up body heat. And when to turn on their fans or misters, Reproductive timing is a, is a big issue with uh, dairy cows. They need to get those, those um, reproductive treatments done at the exact right time to have a good rate of success. So it's just a whole lot of applications for this stuff. Now, models are great, um, but models do not replace looking you know, at the real world and making your decisions based on that. The, the models are tools to help growers make better decisions. So I've been doing that since 1997 with the Apple models. That's great, right? But um, I was buying my weather data from a vendor named Skybit. And you can see weather data all over the place on the web. What's hard is getting the data for specific sites in a data feed in a format that you can bring it into your computer system and use it to drive models. That's a whole different um, thing. So when Skybit got bought out by a much bigger corporation, they didn't want to run Skybit as a business anymore. They bought that company out for other reasons. And so the, the person that started Skybit, I'd been a customer of his for 27 years. He called me up. He really loved um, what Skybit was doing. It was one of his first businesses. It was close to his heart. And he knew that I understood the value of it and said, yeah, I'm going to help you take it on because I know you want that service still. 
And I said, well, that's great, but I had kind of seen it coming. And in the meantime, I had met Sean Burkle, who's going to speak next. And I knew that Sean had the skills to bring down this weather data from the NOAA computer systems. And I wouldn't have to pay anybody. I meant to pay Sean, but I could keep it in house. And so that's where I, Ag Eye Weather got started. And so Sean can talk about this in, in more technical detail because he's the one that's written the code. But this is the uh, service area map this Ag Eye Weather had last year. It has since expanded to the whole continental US. We got a uh, we're working with a national project and they wanted data from across the country so that happened and I want to spend the rest of my time here just saying a few minutes about what gridded weather data is so when they if you need weather data you need two types you need observations and you need forecasts so if you have weather stations all over if you've got that kind of budget uh, for maintenance and just buying them in the first place that's great but you still need forecasts and the way the forecast works is they grid the entire planet vertically and horizontally into these cubes. So each cube gets its own little weather forecast. And it also gets its own little weather observation. Because once the, once the data, once the weather occurs, they measure that too and they, they store that information. So weather gridding started, um, many years ago, but actually the guy that started Skybit invented one of the first weather grids. In fact, probably the first weather grid back in the mid 80s. So this is the level of horizontal spatial resolution they had back in 1990. So those little blue dots there, this is Europe, and this is the UK, and this is the Mediterranean Ocean, believe it or not. Because the low resolution, it's pretty crude. But this is how, whoops, if I can go back, and this is how it was by 2007, so things had gotten a lot better. It looks a lot more realistic. But progress has, has been really zooming on. So here's a 40-year uh, retrospective of how that gridding process has improved. Again, this is back when the, this, each cell was 130 miles across, and then it went down to 78. And then it's down to 38, and now you're starting to get a, you know, a, a recognizable pattern to weather systems. And then it went down to 10 miles, and now it's looking really smooth. And it's, it keeps getting better. Um, this is a seven mile grid from one of Sean's, uh, the models that Sean puts on his main climate office website. So this is seven mile resolution. And this next slide is the same day at finer resolution. And it just shows you, you not only get finer spatial detail, you actually get details that may not show up in another forecast at that very small cell size, you get some very precise information. So what we're using now is at 1.6 miles per cell. So it's gotten even smaller and it's called the National Digital Forecast Database, the NDFD. And the NDFD has several really nice act, um, characteristics to it. It's got that high spatial resolution. It's updated every hour. So when you pull information from it, that information is only an hour old. And what the NDFD does, it takes all the models or a bunch of models from the, the NOAA, the National Weather Service and NOAA that they put out, and it selects the best ones for the particular situation you're in. And it produces sort of a greatest hits forecast in a sense. But it's even better than that because in addition to the computer models, it gets human forecaster input for a final edit. And that just means if there's a, a forecast, there's a agency, there's a forecast office in Gray, Maine, and there's one up in Caribou, and there's such offices in every state or across the country. And so if there's, you know, a forecaster there may happen to know that uh, the Gulf of Maine and that type of situation, the winds tend to blow off the water and it makes it a little colder or something like that. So they can put their spin on the forecast to make it even better. So in terms of using gridded data instead of having stations out there, it's very expensive to run stations. There are a lot of issues about data quality because things happen to stations. Data quality is hard to maintain. Um, that's a whole nother talk we don't have time for. But I just want to talk about one test that was done out in Washington State because they do have a hardware station network, but they can see the writing on the wall that it, 
the maintenance of that was just breaking their budget. So they, they looked into NDFD as a, as a replacement source. Now this test, I wanna point out three things, why this test was really a tough test for the NDFD. First of all, it's the older NDFD. This test was done several years ago. So they're using a three mile grid, not the 1.6 mile grid we're using right now. But more importantly than that, is they were comparing a one day forecast to observations. So they weren't comparing observations to observations. So really the test was at two levels. It was testing the forecast accuracy and it was testing the grid um, accuracy. So like I said, we have gridded forecast and gridded observations now. So it will be a much more interesting test now. And finally, they did this test in a mountainous area, which is really tough for the grid because you go, you know, two miles, or even one mile in a mountainous area, and you know your terrain changes so much it makes it tough to um, to do the gridding. But these charts show they accumulated degree days um, using the station data that's along the horizontal axis, and they compared it to the same accumulations they got from the gridded data, the NDFD. And if you had a perfect correlation, you'd be on this red line each time. So these are different locations. And it just shows you that by and large, they were pretty much right on the, right on the bean there. So a red line is a perfect correlation. So they, they put that, those um, degree day accumulations for, for a particular pest, in this case, the apple maggot fly, which I showed you earlier. And they figured, you know, if the, if the difference is less than three days in terms of accumulated degree days for estimating when this insect is gonna hatch out in late summer, we figure that's good enough. And so these are the number of days difference for each of those for different sites of the difference between the station data and the NDFD forecast data. Again, I wanna emphasize this was testing against a forecast grid, not an observation grid. And what they found was the difference was generally two days or less. So their final conclusion was, it is clear that the NDFD data has great promise for use as virtual weather stations. And that is my last slide. And I'll turn it over to Sean. And, uh, uh, thank you everyone. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. And I'd like to say that uh, working with Lily and Glenn and uh, Shauna and also um, uh, Aaron Roche on this project has been a really wonderful experience and I think it's been very productive meeting with the stakeholders with um, uh, many different farmers um, across several meetings uh, was really interesting. Um, as a state climatologist, I enjoy learning about what different stakeholders need and in partic particularly in terms of climate data and weather data. And so what I wanted to uh, share with you first before going into um, Guy Guy Weather uh, was just to say a few things about the Maine Climate Office, which is um, um, I'm developing this through the Climate Change Institute here at the University of Maine. And there's uh, presently a website that I've put together that has Maine-based station data, uh, weather forecasts, and climate data. Um, and one of my, my primary goal is to make data for Maine easily available, both climate data and weather data. And so when I began working with uh, MECAN, the Maine Climate and Ag Network, um, I saw this as a great opportunity to uh, merge what I had already started with the Maine Climate Office, begin working more with Cooperative Extension, uh, having further outreach efforts uh, with stakeholders and um, and then also working more with weather data in addition to climate data. And if I can advance the slide here. Uh, the, this slide here just shows an example of, of historical data. Say if you wanna know about either past temperature or precipitation, um, we can access daily data or monthly data, annual. And I like to try to make things available in a form that's easily digestible, whether it's a time series chart or through spatial maps and also through spreadsheets for those who, who wanna work with the actual data values. And as Glenn mentioned, that was one um, aspect of ag -I weather uh, that in his case, uh, he needs access to weather data streams in order for ag radar and um, decision models that, of that sort. And, um, 
and so I've been, as I've been developing these various tools, I'm trying to keep in mind, make it simple, make it easy to use, uh, provide access to maps for spatial context, time series, try to make it interactive. Unfortunately, I can't show you the interactive qualities right now, but, uh, and also access to well-formatted spreadsheets where people can download them and immediately start working with the data. And um, also, um, during this time, during the past several years, I've been developing a website called Climate Reanalyzer. Um, and this is through support from the Climate Change Institute and the University of Maine. And Climate Reanalyzer, of course, is a, a more global scale, but also provides access to climate data uh, and also weather forecast maps. And so when Glenn approached me initially about um, whether or not I could help provide um, uh, weather data, I was already starting from a framework that I began developing, accessing uh, NOAA operational models to get access to weather forecast, primarily to make maps at that stage. But I was able to start from a script base to then start extracting time series and to derive agricultural metrics. And also, um, early in the stages of ag -I weather, we also received some funding from the USDA Northeast Climate Hub. And, um, the project has evolved quite a bit since then, uh, but I, I want to mention that. And um, Glenn mentioned the closure of Skype, but that was real impetus for um, bringing Ag -I Weather online. Uh, and so as, as it stands right now, Ag -I Weather is operational. And twice a day, uh, the system sends out e emails uh, with forecast tables by email. Uh, CSV files are spreadsheet readable files for ready uh, for any any customer who who would like that. We are servicing um, more than 100 sites across uh, the eastern U.S. currently, and also about 50 sites across. And um, and I'm in the process of developing a, an interactive. Uh, website for it and it's uh, nearing completion but not quite ready yet but this slide here shows an example of um, the time series chart and also um, weather icons at, at the top. Um, I'm working on making this intuitive including more agricultural metrics inc uh, including growing degree days, um, solar radiation, evapotranspiration, and um, uh, a number of other variables and from the feedback that we've gotten from the farmers during this project and reaching out to stakeholders and asking what do you need and what form would you like it, I'm using that to inform how I develop the site. And so I'm going, really going to try to cater it so that um, uh, for the agricultural community who can utilize this, so it's not just another site where you get a weather forecast, but you can also access the agriculture um, specific uh, metrics. And here's just a, a screen grab uh, showing part of the um, the forecast table that goes out in an email. Um, what actually comes out in emails is quite a bit larger, but uh, this slide, it shows some of the variables that we're pulling. And that includes from these models that uh, Glenn described, uh, um, includes hourly temperature, um, dew point temperature, surface temperature, and also uh, two inch and 10 inch soil moisture and soil temperature, which is something that could be important. And um, one thing I'm in the process now is validating that against uh, pretty sparse data that, that exists to see if, are, are the models uh, coming close to reality in terms of say soil moisture and soil temperature, which could be important for uh, many uses. And um, also precipitation amount and precipitation probability. And I mentioned before evapotranspiration and then uh, solar radiation fields, ground heat flux. And because we have a variety of different, um, uh, people want access to these weather data for a variety of things. There are other uh, researchers who are using our service now who are, are also running ag decision models. And so they're working with the CSV files and grabbing up a specific set of variables. But then there are, are some farmers who simply want the 10-day um, the forecast or the three-day forecast. And uh, with that, I wish I had a prettier slide to, to end with, but uh, I would like to uh, thank everyone again and uh, now turn this back over to Lily.
who will um, give concluding remarks, and then I also look forward to answering questions. Thank you. Great, Sean. Um, I, I guess um, I'll just finish with, uh, a, we missed a slide in there, no problem, but the gist of it was a summary of what the growers wanted to see, and that's basically what Sean just explained. Um, they really would like to have an easily, um, easy to read, um, accessible website, phone app. Um, most people wanted um, an online way to access uh, the weather information, but also these uh, pest and crop tools. Uh, with the exception of some rural places in Maine that of course don't have internet. And so those farmers are looking um, they, they still use hotlines that we have through extension. So there are uh, some phone numbers you can call and get your Apple report or you can get your um, blueberry mummyberry report uh, by calling a phone number. So, so that's another thing to think about. Um, and what else? It was um, uh, the growers wanted to have uh, easily customizable uh, resource online. So if they were able to select which uh, pest tools they want to receive or which weather factors they want to receive, that would be great. Um, and a lot of them did indicate that they would like to have text message um, alerts for frost events or different weather events. Um, and that um, they would like those alerts in addition to having a website, a one one resource for all um, all agricultural crop and pest tools and weather information. So with that, um, that's it. And I guess our next steps are um, just to keep our project going and um, deliver these tools in a really clear way to farmers. So that's what we're working on now. And happy to answer any questions. Hi everyone, can you hear me? This is, this is Linda Silka. Um, can we all give a virtual clap for this um, just wonderful, interesting, interesting um, presentation. And what I'm going to do for just a few minutes is to take some of the questions um, that were on the chat and some of the things that I can imagine that people um, um, are thinking, but it's just so exciting to see um, weather tools uh, for farmers and the discussion of what that means and how you go about finding out that information. Um, were there surprises and puzzles? So when you had your questionnaire, your survey, or when you uh, had the focus groups, were there things that you went, oh, really? And it's fine if there are. Well, I, one thing I was surprised to hear is um, how many people um, still get their forecasts from the nightly news. As a, I mean, many still many do use a smartphone or um, check weather.gov or weather.com, but many people do check the, the news in the evening before bed or first thing in the morning, and um, that that surprised me. But. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. I would ditto that. And just one of the apple growers who gets, who had access to ag radar, but was also getting up at five in the morning. And he had a routine of checking three different television station news because he thought each one had its own little way of looking at things. And so that's how important weather is to them. And another thing that jumped out to me was smartphones, how much people want smartphone access. Very interesting. I, I grew up in a, uh, most of my relatives are farmers in Iowa. And when we go down to visit my grandparents, we all had to get up at five in the morning to listen to WHO to hear about the weather and what was going to happen. So what you're saying is just um, uh, so interesting. One of the things that I know we all found interesting is the extent to which you emphasized um, leveraging the existing extension farmer relationships, but also then, you know, uh, when you talked about the focus group, um, 
and afterwards in the final meeting that you showed them the changes you'd made from what you'd learned. Can you tell people a little bit about that process, how you knew that was important to do or sort of what was going on there? Sure. Um, so farmers like results and they want, they <laughs> want, to, they love to, uh, I think our relationship with farmers is strengthened by actually acting on something they asked us to do. Um, and, and in this case, we were at, luckily, we were able to do a little bit of it. We definitely can't and couldn't, didn't have time to um, create the whole office website, you know, to do that. But um, the three, so AgRadar, or um, AgriNet, the wild blueberry website, uh, we were able to add growing degree days to that and um, make it a little more user friendly. And then Sean showed you um, that he's, what he's added. Great, thank you. That's very useful. One of the questions that was asked in the chat, um, and um, not everybody perhaps saw it or the responses was, did you involve or speak to organic farmers? And could you tell us if you heard anything differently from them? Yep, we, we had organic farmers included as well. Um, and uh, in every group, uh, vegetable, wild blueberry, and apple. And let's see. Um, they are, you know, they're, of course, they're less interested in spray timing. But I think the other factors like planting date and harvest date, frost prediction, those are very critical uh, pieces of weather information for them. You used um, the language. Of, oh, go ahead. Go well, ahead. I was going to say for spray timing, you know, organic growers also have to spray sometimes. And the materials they have access to tend to be much more narrowly focused. So I talked about with the coddling moth there, when you're using these narrow materials, you have to know exactly when they need to go on. So like BT for caterpillars, you can use that for some apple pests, some, you know, some moth caterpillars, but it only lasts for about five days. So you can't just put it out there and call it good. You need to know when to put it on. Interesting. So you used the language, the important language of decision support tools and um, asking what they were using and the majority of um, your our participants weren't using any yet. So where do you think a couple of years from now that's going to be? And is that language becoming commonplace in the farming communities? Well, uh, yeah, it is becoming more common. And I think as we have a generational change, shift in mm -hmm. the farming community as well, um, we're entering a world where the farmers really do, where, where they really are more tech savvy. Um, so it's becoming a high tech job, it sounds like. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so if people were to follow any of the three of you around on a typical day, what would they see you doing? If they decided they so love this talk, they want to become you, what would they see? Well, I spend a lot of time in my basement at the computer, but <laughs> <laughs> Len and Lily probably go to more interesting places, but <laughs> But our background's not as good. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'll speak uh, for the Apple world. Um, I spend a lot of time on the computer too, to be honest but also the good chunk of it in the summertime, spring and summer and, and early fall, but is, is in the orchards checking out, you know, what's going on in the orchard. And then a lot of time on the phone or in person with growers talking about what we're seeing out there and what it means. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm out in the field um, maybe four days a week. Uh, in the summer from May through August. And um, I have a few grad students and a research assistant. So we've, I've got a little team that is very fun. And uh, we spend time on at least, I think this year we had, 
a research applied research project on 10 different farms. Mm -hmm. um, so we're out there collecting a lot of data. Um, and then this time of year, we enter all the data we collected and analyze it, write reports. Um, we write an annual wild library research and extension report for anybody to see. And we write more grants to do it again next year. So. <laughs> and oh, and oh go I ahead. Add that um, in normal times, um, I give uh, a couple dozen talks throughout the year, and uh, and so I, I um, give public presentations, and so that gets me out of out away from the computer, and and that's one yeah. thing I I always enjoyed was giving public talks, and I've been giving them by Zoom, now certainly not not quite the same, but still good. And um, uh, so that's one aspect of, of what I do, but I, I don't have field work. Um, um, unfortunately, I, I don't go into the field, but um, yeah, most of what I do is computer based. Mm -hmm. And if people, and there are a lot of great students in the audience, and if they wanted to become you and be able to do what you do, what, <laughs> Lily's shaking her head, no, no, no. What, should are there particular kinds of um, experiences they should have majors that they should do are there summer opportunities if they just wanted to follow you around one day once you were back out in the field again so what would you say to the people listening to the talk about if they wanted to become you what what they should do um try to work on a farm like volunteer on a farm or um, yeah, I think, I think that'd be really eye-opening. I'd say if something interests you, go with it and see where it takes you. Don't just think you have to, you know, you get your assignments from your classes and just limit yourself to that. If something strikes your fancy, check it out, dig into it. If I could jump in, uh, I found that taking classes that you um, at first thought you either wouldn't enjoy or might not quite be your cup of tea, because I, I learned, um, I had a couple surprises where I got really interested in the subject and took me down some unexpected paths that turned out to be really good. And my background is actually in uh, earth sciences. And so I, in the past, I did get out in the field and got to go on some really interesting uh, research trips. Um, and so I, I would recommend uh, seek, seek out opportunities and be willing to try new experiences and, um, um, and things, things will work out. Another great, great answers. Uh, another thing that um, you all talked about is how to make data for Maine more accessible and how to make data easily digestible, like climate data, weather data, how, that you're dealing with highly complex information. So have you seen yourself sort of learning patterns of strategies in terms of thinking about how you think about the uh, issues of the digestibility? Because that has to do with how the data is presented, but also who's going to use it. So thoughts about that? Well, one approach I take is I, um, um, I, I'll look at uh, other websites, for example, to see what, what existing approaches there are, in part because I don't want to just re, uh, replicate the wheel. And, uh, but also to see, uh, get ideas from other presentations. And um, so I'm constantly, I, it's a never ending um, effort to improve the, the code that I develop. And uh, but I also like to get feedback from people, just try to find out what works and what doesn't. And then behind the scenes, there's a constant effort to simplify the code, make it more efficient, and um, um, things of, of that sort. And then trying to keep up with the new trends, the, the new uh, software libraries that become available, the new interfaces that can be put onto a website. Um, and so it's a, it's a continually evolving process. Really interesting. Other thoughts? Glenn? Well, I would just say that presentation really matters. We tend to get siloed into these 
numbers people versus the arty people and <laughs> you need everything because people are human beings. And so I spend hours simplifying graphs, taking stuff out. Um, and we, in the sciences, uh, it's easy to get so wrapped up in the statistics and the numbers to forget that the presentation and the, uh, the aesthetics of it really does matter because you're trying to communicate something and it's that communication is key. I, I so agree with you. I'm married to somebody who studies how people use graphs, the psychology of graph display and all the ways we do it wrong. <laughs> I want to talk to your husband. <laughs> Lily, do you have anything you want to add about? Oh, um, I think they covered it really. Um, just taking a step back and putting yourself in their shoes. Um, we can get pretty caught up in the details of science and statistics, but um, if you can think back to when you were new to the field or right. um, I just continually bring myself into the farmer's shoes and think, okay, if I were in the field, what's going to make sense to me? I need quick, very accurate, very clear information. I don't have time for a whole bunch of science jargon. Really, yeah, just, just, just wonderful. The, the combination of the three points of view you shared with us today really help us see how important it is to work together and the real benefits from that and how important it is to be paying attention to what farmers need and to weather and to climate change. Um, my last remark, in addition to just having learned so much, and I know if you could, everybody could walk up and talk to you, they'd say that as well, is when I was a kid and we were, I was at one of the family farms and it was in early June and the corn had just, you know, they just planted the corn and it had come up and a huge, huge storm that they didn't expect came through and destroyed all, all the corn. And it really made me think about having grown up in the town where I, Iowa State University is, it made me think, oh, maybe that university is helpful or can be helpful. <laughs> So thank you for taking time out of your busy, busy uh, days for all of us to learn. I'm sure you'll hear from some of the people who got to listen to you today because it was a great presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Take care.